I'm E on the mic, and you're watching the War Zone Sports Network. Let's get ready to rumble. Step into the war zone. 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 What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the war zone. I'm Joe Morley. Of course, you don't see that guy, Mike, on the mic because he's still suspended because Tony Tucker and I couldn't believe what Mike said last week to Mr. Fernando Ramirez about Corey Lindsley being the next Tom Brady, being what Tom Brady means to the Buccaneers. And of course, Mike was like, that's out of context. It's out of context. But that's beside the point. So we got Tony Tucker here as my co-host. You know, I upgraded co-host today, as you can say. And then we have the man, the myth, the TikTok legend, Mr. E on the mic. If you guys don't know him, get to know him throughout this episode. What's going on, fellas? What's going on, Joe? I'm- John Morley in the building. And we got Tony Tucker. I'm, I'm very, very happy to be filling in for Mike. Um, you know, that was an egregious statement. I reached out to the Lindsay family for comment and they went into hiding. I was just like, you can't put that kind of pressure on this young man. Been working on my mic on the mic impression, you know, like Chargers, 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 Stan Humphrey, Natron Meads, Phil Rivers, Charger, Charger, Chargers, 17 and 0. So I'll, I'll weave that in throughout the show in honor of uh, Mike on the mic. But yes, he'll be back to fill this seat with all of his, his wonderful nonsense. I saw what you saw, what you posted, Tony, about um, even Corey Lindsay's parents don't hype him up as much as Mike has been hyping this guy up. <laughs> I, that's what I love. I love that he would come on and say, so the Buccaneers, they needed one guy to get it done. And who did the Chargers need? And I was like, where is he going with this? Where is he? And I'm sitting there and he's like, and we got Corey Lindsay at time. I was like, who? The center from the Green Bay, you drew a correlation like here. That's like Oregon Trail m- road mapping to make that to make that leap right there. But it's that's what we pieces, love about Mike. It's What's that? It's one of the pieces to to build a championship, but that's not going to catch you all the way there, though. <laughs> oh, there's never never have the two those two been spoken in the same breath. Other than like Corey Lindsay will be. Tom Brady's center in the Pro Bowl this year. That's it. That's as close as you can get those two in the same sentence. But Mike on the mic says Super Bowl bound Corey Lindsay and the Chargers going all the way. I don't know if he exactly those are the exact words, but those are the exact words I'm going to say he said. And Tony's yes. right with me on that. But yeah, Mike's Mike's off the show. Tony's on the show. He's here. And E, you are a Miami Dolphins fan. And why not? Since you're on the show, why not hit up Miami Dolphins right now? We'll talk some Miami Dolphins because they're making some moves. They're making the trades. They're doing all this, and they're the number. They're the team that owns a bunch of draft picks in the upcoming draft. So, um, first, E, your thoughts on that big trade from number three to number twelve, then back to number six. I, I, I was surprised as how a lot of people were last week. I'm going to be honest. It was we went from number three to twelve, and it was kind of crazy how the four ers move up from twelve to three. And we got some draft pick from the Boy Niners the first round of the next year and the following year. And then we got the Philadelphia, and I thought that, that was it. But we got the Philadelphia's pick to the number six. And then we gave them a, the first round for, from us. But at the same time, for Miami, though, the number six is well, who are we going to draft in number six? Because we went from number three to 12, and I was like, okay, we might get a wide receiver. But then we come back to six. So it's like – are we going to actually stay at six or are we going to trade away with somebody? Because I heard some rumors there that we have the six spot, but maybe some teams may want to jump in there. But I think this is, I think it's a great move, especially for, for a young team, like Brian Flores and Tula Tagaloa, and has the draft capital to, to build the future for Miami. And if we stay at number six, I wouldn't mind, I wouldn't mind seeing any of the, the top wide receivers or maybe the tight end Kyle Pitts coming to Miami. Now, it may be crazy to talk to talk about Kyle Pitts because maybe he get drafted by the Falcons before. But if you get Kyle Pitts, he's a he's a do maker. I understand we have Mike Jacecki, but at the same time, Kyle Pitts is a great dual threat. He's gonna be he's six six, gonna be two fifty by the time he starts the season, and it's gonna be hard to stop him because he can change the speech. He can go from slow to fast all of a sudden. If you see him in Florida, great tight end. I'm gonna say that. That's what I think. Miami should stay at number six overall, and I love the trades. I love how we won. I like how the 49ers say they won the trade, but 
I still say Miami won the trade, though. I heard a lot of 49ers fans saying that we won this trade. We, Jimmy G is not that guy. Trey Lance is the guy. <laughs> so that's – I'm going to say Miami won, win, won this trade. I'm telling you right now. Hey, Joe, can I get some clarification real quick? Because they went to 12, and then they went back to 6. When they went back to 6, did they have to give something up? Like, did they get something, right? Because there had to be other compensation in there. They gave up their first-round pick uh, uh, for 2022. So they acquired the Niners' first-round pick for the next two years. But when they traded up from 12 to 6, they gave up one of their first-round picks For uh, for next year. Okay. So when I look at this, all of that stuff doesn't really matter. And we can't even tell who won any of this stuff until after these players are drafted. And if, if the Niners move into number three, this reeks of Mitch Trubisky all over again, like we're going to move up and take Mac Jones. Are you freaking kidding me? Mac Jones. I heard about that. I was like, what? Mac Jones. This doesn't make any sense there. And you, you mentioned if Atlanta sneaks in and gets pits, if they let Justin Fields fall to four, you got to take the, the the Atlanta native at four and let him sit for two years behind Matt Ryan. You would be going, you'd be upgrading in year three, you know, or at least midway through the second year of Justin Fields at quarterback there. So the Dolphins, that's, that, that's our, we're here for you, for the Miami Dolphins <laughs> at six. If they don't get one of these receivers at six and they trade out of that, I don't understand why you stick with Tua. Like he needs, he needs a weapon. He needs a dependable number one who's going to be on the field. I'm going to go and I'm going to check them. I'm going to be like, do you have any relation to Devontae Parker? No. Can you stay on the field? That'd be great. We, would, we just need healthy bodies for Tua. Pitts, uh, what's the Jamar Chase? Yeah, I almost Jamar said Jamarcus Chase. Russell. <laughs> I want to bring him up. Yeah, I think, okay, the Dolphins own, they basically own this draft. They owned it last year. They're going to own it this year with the picks. They have, not only do they have number six, they have number 18. Then they have two second round picks and a third round pick, right? So I don't know. I, I think they look at number six and we got to, we'll talk about this in a minute of where the quarterbacks and stuff will go. But I think if the quarterback falls, I don't think Miami's done trading. I think they, they could tr- fall back to number eight, number seven, number eight, uh, number nine, do all that, and still get a wide receiver. Because looking at Miami, they need a wide receiver, and they need a running back, in my opinion. Those are the two things. And then after that, you might want to go offensive line. But basically, yeah, build around Tua, because you're going to say that Tua is your guy. Let's get him some weapons, get him some help on the offensive side of the ball. The defense looked outstanding last year. They did their job. They carried that team. So with the picks, they have 6, 18, 36, 50, and 81. So that's uh, five top 100 picks. You better do something good with it. And if they can add to it, I think they're going to. Um, but wide receiver, and like I know I know everybody, everybody's in love with Kyle Pitts right now. Everybody's in love with Kyle Pitts. But he's a tight end. At the end of the day, he's a still a tight end. And, and do, does a tight end help you right now? Uh, he is a playmaker, but he's a tight end. So I'm not sure that's that's the way to go with the Dolphins, but the Dolphins own this draft coming up. E, can I jump in real quick here? Yeah. Because I want to say this. Like, you you kind of, kind of crapped a little bit on the tight end position, but I think that's actually the perfect position for Tua because <clears> it's more going to be the middle of the field. He's He doesn't really have the arm strength that these other guys do. I mean, it's good. Don't get me wrong. But, like, if you can have a guy that's in the center of the field, we're seeing what these big F- – you guys have Darren Waller for the Raiders, what Travis Kelsey's doing. If you can get somebody that can fill in like that in the center of the field, and he's unguardable. You can't put linebackers. you got to cover him with sm- smaller nickel corners. Like, I think that's the perfect weapon is to have a guy that can work the middle of the field for a guy who, to me, has average arm strength. Now, this is, you know, coming from a guy who has a cannon, and there's video evidence of that. I can show it to anybody who denies it. I can throw outside the numbers, but we're not sure if Tua can. Woo! We got to see that Tony Tucker pro. <laughs> pro. I bet you, I bet you run a 4-4 like right now. This this year, everybody's running a 4-4-40. So we got Tony Tucker 4-4 with the arm strength. We're going to put him in the quarterback position. So let's uh, – I mean, E, you got anything else to say on your Dolphins right now? Uh, is your chance to make your claim to fame right now 
for Miami, really, you just have to draft good. You got to select the players. I know we got those draft capital, but it just depends on who we draft in the, in the draft. Like you said, I agree with the you need a wide receiver, a running back. We should get like O-line and linebacker in the second round, third rounds, especially since we both need those two positions as well for Miami. But just really hit the wide receiver market, especially how Parker's been out, absent. He's in and out. You got Preston Williams in and out as well. You didn't hear him after the Arizona game. You never heard him ever again because he got injured. I swear to God. Like you never – there's no other injury report you ever see Preston Williams in. And then you got Jakeen Grant. He's a great player, but he's very short. That's the only problem. So you definitely need to address the wide receiver. And for the running back position, we have Malcolm Brown, but I don't think he's going to be reliable in the Miles Gaskin. So we definitely need a running back. And that's pretty much what I got for my fins, Joe. And that, that's the good thing about this NFL draft. This NFL draft is loaded in wide receivers and it's loaded in offensive linemen. You can get a, a day one offensive lineman in the third round, uh, according to all these scouts and everybody out there. Same thing with the wide receivers. We saw how, how good that wide receiver class was last year. And they're saying this one's even better. So, I mean, if the Dolphins are going to fill their holes, they're going to, this is the greatest draft to have it. And that's, I think that's why they're moving around and doing what they got to do. But let's go on to the biggest position in this draft and the one that everybody's talking about, because this might be the first year we ever see four quarterbacks taken one, two, three, and four. So you guys already know the quarterbacks and the draft. It's Trevor. These are the main guys. I'll, I'll throw the main guys out there. Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, Trey Lance, Mac Jones, Zach Wilson. Those are your top five some people can argue who the five, fifth guy is, but which quarterbacks are you guys, if you were a general manager right now, you were the, the guy, which quarterbacks would you take in the, in the NFL draft? Uh, I'll go first. So I, this is where I would have it. I would go Trevor Lawrence, and then there's a huge gap to me. I like him. It's like we spend all of this time nitpicking him apart because he's been ready for the NFL for like two years. Once he gets there, he's going to fit in nicely. He's way more athletic than people ever talk about. He throws a great ball. He's a good leader. He's played in big moments. So he's my number one. Justin Fields would be my, my number two at that position. I like him better. I think another thing is, is that like somebody's making a good point. I think it was Orlovsky the other day was saying that like, just you can't hold it against him that he didn't have to make second reads just because his first read was open most of the time was he supposed to show off to you and show you well like that guy's wide open but let me see what my third and fourth options are doing no he's trying to win football games so i and also that can progress we act like that's something that can't be advanced once he gets time and i think will really benefit from having that sort of aaron Rodgers into the nfl we go to the third quarterback I'm going Trey Lance because Trey Lance is the future. Mac Jones is the past. We keep comparing him to Matt Ryan, which is you're comparing him to his ability to play well late at the end of games. That how do you how do you compare that? You you can't know if he can remain calm in those situations. Also, Mac Jones knows that offense. You're trying to tell me that if Jimmy G starts for a year, that Justin Fields or Trey Lance can't learn that offense in 16 games? Mac Jones to me is maybe even behind somebody put on my radar radar the uh, the Texas A and M kid uh, or not Texas who's there's another kid out there that, that can ball and then Zach Wilson would be at four um, after the pro day everybody fell in love with this guy and I was like hey he's in a pair of Tommy Johns you know and a tight T shirt throwing footballs we'll see if that looks the same when you're playing behind the Jets offensive line <laughs> looks yeah. like in New York City. You know, like he should call Danny Dimes because I'm sure Danny would be like, bro, you don't want any of this New York heat. <laughs> the Jets and the Giants are always pain. They always feel pain with our offensive line, I swear. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, Dan, Dan Orvlowski has come out and he's taken a lot of heat for uh, what he said about Justin Fields as well. He also said that he uh, was not getting the looks because he was unprepared or not a work ethic guy. And then he came back and uh, backtracked on that one. Um, after he did more research, he said, so he should have done the research before and not, I don't know. I see Justin Fields as somebody who's, uh, I, I'm, I'm with you, um, Tony. I think Justin Fields is the top guy. And that, and I, I don't know. I, Zach Wilson against, uh, what was it? Is it coastal? Coastal Carolina. Carolina. Remember he got cracked. I remember putting a highlight up of him getting cracked and not having a great game. And 
like you said, they're they're building him up in shorts and t-shirts right now, and I'm not liking it. I always thought it was Trevor Lawrence, and then Justin Fields, just like you said, and then Zach Wilson. Then after that, we can go because Trey Lance is great, but I think he still needs that. I think Trey Lance is one of those guys that won't come in and start day one, and and maybe not all of them can, but I think Trey Lance is more of the wait and see kind of guy. Mac Jones, I don't know where the heck Mac Jones came from because he went from being a second, third rounder to now being a top 10 pick, which is crazy. And, and another guy I want to throw in there is Kyle Trask. Where's, where's he at? He was getting all that buzz. Now he's gone. Uh, it's just interesting to see these guys being talked about and how much people are falling in love with them without even a combine happening. Yeah. Trust me. I believe, I believe in that. Like, it was all of a sudden you hear Mac Jones all of a sudden being better than Justin Fields, which was kind of the craziest talk I ever heard in my life, where you hear Mac Jones is much better than Justin Fields. It's like, where did that come from? I remember Kyle Trask was in there, but like Mac Jones all of a sudden better than Justin Fields. You'd rather have Mac Jones and Justin Fields, the big build your, as your quarterback. But just going back to the top, top five, I'll go. Trevor Lawrence, of course. Trevor Lawrence is a great runner. He's a great leader, as Tony said. He's a great leader. I, I definitely will pick Trevor Lawrence first. Second would be Justin Fields. I don't know why everyone would think Mac Jones will be like three or two all of a sudden. Maybe the foreign think that, but I don't know. And then Zach Wilson. Yes, Zach Wilson's been doing pretty good at the, comp, the little pro day. But, of course, like you said, the Coastal Carolina game was horrendous. That's probably the only game they probably can backlash on Zach Wilson. And then you go Trey Lance, and then you go Mac Jones, really. And I know Tony, Tony was bringing up uh, – it's Kellen Maud, right? Kellen Maud. Yeah, yeah, Kellen there we Moore, go. Is it? is it Kellen Moore? Kellen. No, he's the quarterback's coach for the Cowboys. His name's – Oh, something. Yeah, Kellen Mond, M-O-N-D from Texas A&M. There we go. Uh, they're saying he's like a poor man's uh, Colin Kaepernick or, or better Joshua Dobbs uh, comparison. It's, it's funny because, like you said, Mac Jones in our eyes, and it hurts – like it hurts me and gives me a headache whenever I say Mac Jones to the 49ers at number three – because like you said, I think you're taking a step back into the old NFL of the old quarterbacks, the old pocket quarterbacks that can't move. I mean, Mac Jones ran a, what, a 4-7, 4-8. So he can move a little bit, and he's a little quicker than we think he is. But he's that old school mentality where we're looking at the, the Russell Wilsons, the Deshaun Watson, the Lamar Jacksons of the world, and we're saying we want those guys as our quarterbacks now. Yeah, even guys like like Aaron Rodgers. So I've been I kind of have this like half baked uh, little analogy going on in my head. I'm gonna try and I'm gonna try and do this in real time. <laughs> if you look at the NFL and you compare it to a business, right? Straight out of college, you would never hire a kid out of college and ask him to be your CEO, which is the quarterback position in the NFL. You would hire him with great expectations. He'd get coffee, sit in on board meetings, take notes and stuff like that. That is the perfect setup for any quarterback transitioning is a little bit of time to get in, get acclimated, see the speed of the game, you know, have a couple plays here and there. But when you're asking Zach Wilson or really any of these guys to go from the amateur level to the CEO position, it's an, it's an unwinnable task for most people. There are very few people who are ready to sit in the CEO chair of quarterback in the NFL on day one. I think Trevor Lawrence could be one of those guys, but he's also going to Jacksonville. They have problems. They do have a, I think they're bringing in the right sort of head coach for him to make this transition. But Zach Wilson with a rookie head coach in the jets in a tough division where Belichick is just on a revenge tour. The bills are getting better. And we got homies dolphins down here with Brian Flores ready to attack. We could be looking at, at Zach Wilson not even making it to Thanksgiving. Like, this is going to be a better division with the Patriots coming back. And just the, the rigors of the NFL, I worry for him. And I would love Trey Lance and Justin Fields to both get a year sitting from the sidelines. I'm with you. I think any quarterback that goes to the Jets is going to have a hard time. They're going to have some fun. I mean, they, they better – and they better run for their lives because, like you said – Belichick, we already know what he does to rookie quarterbacks. Brian Flores is just like him. Sean Dermott loves to feast on him. They're going to – that whole division right there, I haven't even looked at the rest of the Jets' schedule. I know they got an easy schedule uh, with that extra week that they put. They put the Jets and the Eagles, so they, they kind of helped them out right there to give them that win. But 
It's tough. It's tough to say. I, are we even sure the Jets at number two are taking Zach Wilson? I know that's the hype. I know that's the hype. But are we sure they're they're even taking him? They might, you know, be jump, taking one of these other guys and just throwing smoke at us too. I mean, I mean, I would say ninety nine percent they are taking Zach Wilson, but there is there still is that one percent chance that they throw us all a curveball. You know that that rare chance that the Jets will surprise everybody and they pick an offensive line instead of a quarterback. That slim chance, but hey, anything can happen in NFL draft. Like Daniel Jones going to the Giants when everyone thought it was Dwayne Haskins that one time, that one point in time. Give me like some examples right there. So you never know who's gonna get selected. Like we all know Trevor Lawrence is definitely going to Jacksonville. You no, know, if Jacksonville picks somebody else, then they're crazy. <laughs> From all yeah. Of- I, hang on. I don't want to get anything twisted. Cause somebody came to me the, the other day and they said, would you be bashing this hard if the Jets had the number one pick and they were getting everybody's glory boy, Trevor Lawrence? Yeah, I would. I'd still feel bad and worried about Trevor Lawrence going to the Jets and being asked to have this Herculean task of bringing the Jets back to glory. Well, back to glory. I, I don't even know when that was. None of us were alive. Our parents were still in high school when the Jets had glory. When Henry Ruggs caught that touchdown to beat the Jets and the Raiders won that game, Trevor Lawrence was sweating. And then when the Jets came back and won a couple more games, he was like, whew, I'm not going to New York. I'm going to Jacksonville because just media alone, it's going to be a lot different just going to Jacksonville. But like you said, both teams have their issues. Both teams have their issues. But Jacksonville, I don't know why. I don't know why I I think Jacksonville's better prepared than the Jets because I I just don't know why I'm going that way. But I think, yeah, he he won't have as much pressure in Jacksonville as the the New York media is going to put on whoever they take. But, I mean, so you guys right now, let's take Trevor Lawrence out of it. Trevor Lawrence is gone. He's already – let's say we're the Jets GM now. We're we're Joe Douglas, right? That's his name. So I'm going to put you on the clock. Trevor Lawrence is gone. You got the number two pick. Go ahead and take your quarterback. E, I'll start with you. I'll go with Zach Wilson. I go with what everyone's falling in love with in New York, Zach Wilson. I think Zach Wilson is definitely going to be a keeper for New York. I know there's Sam Darnold still in the mix, but no one knows where Sam Darnold's going to go. Will he be traded? Will he be the starter? And then maybe Zach Wilson starts. But on the, on the clock, I'll go with Zach Wilson. Although there's Trey Lance, there's Justin Fields. I don't think the Jets are sold with Justin Fields and same thing with Trey Lance. So they got to go with Zach Wilson. I feel the Jets are going to be in love with, with Zach Wilson so more than you, the music. two other quarterbacks. Boom, da, 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 da. <laughs> Zach Wilson to the Jets for E on the mic. And we'll go to Tony Tucker. Okay, so I am a, I'm a Michigander and I hate supporting Ohio State Buckeyes, right? But I'm going to say the Jets... And, the, and your Dolphins, E, are in the same category. When you have a young quarterback who's about to take over, the best friend is offensive line and a healthy running game. And that's why when you said they have these five picks in the top of the draft for the Dolphins, I was like, oh, you got a defensive head coach and a young quarterback. These teams need to be filling up on beastly offensive linemen and getting a good running game. Because that's the really the only way they can survive. If you think a rookie is going to come in and the recipe to success is throwing 40 times a game, it is going to be a bloodbath of interceptions. You're going to be having a second guy going, Darnold was right. I'm seeing ghosts, coach. They're everywhere. I can't stop. I don't know why I made him some old, like, you know, withery character from a Dickens novel. But that's the way that I see what is going on with – with the quarterback position. So I'm taking Justin Fields because of his size and his playmaking ability, but I would not want him starting day one for the Jets either. So that puts me on the clock. We just had Zach Wilson and you you took Justin Fields. So I have to take the other one. Mac. No, no, I'm just kidding. Oh, <laughs> Mac. <I'm just> kidding. <laughs> that's, a, that's a typical Jets pick. No, I, I, I I'm with you and, uh, I, I'm with Tony on this one. I'm, I'm taking Justin Fields if I'm the Jets at number two. That's my my opinion. I I don't know. I've seen more big bigger plays out of him. I see more potential out of him than Zach Wilson. It's just a guy that I I, I feel more comfortable in my mind taking. And we both could be wrong. And the, and the Jets take the right choice of Zach Wilson. But if I'm sitting at number two, Justin Fields is my guy. Um, even though I don't feel the Jets need a quarterback at this time because I think they should keep Sam Bradford. 
Or did I say Sam Bradford? What the hell? Sam Bradford. Like, Sam Bradford. Where, where's that? Oh, where's that yeah. Sam Bradford coming from? Like that's I was like what? Are you making, I just showed my age a little there? bit. Like yeah. he's like somebody remembered my name. Yeah, Sam Bradford sitting there going, "Ooh, what? What's going on?" Like, <laughs> Re- <laughs> ooh, Sam Bradford. Reviving like, Sam Bradford out of the grave, man. <laughs> man, I just, Joe, I have a question before we move on to our next topic. I was thinking about this while I was walking the dog today. And it's about the Patrick Mahomes phenomenon, right? Because he's kind of, he kind of came out of nowhere. And I don't remember Andy Reid really hyping him up. Like, I don't remember anybody going like, oh, we got to get here. And that's the year the Bears traded up. And it was sort of Deshaun Watson and uh, these other guys that went later in the draft. Is there, is there a little bit of, if the Niners are like, hey, we're going to trade up to number three but we can't be throwing a bunch of smoke at the guy that we want because then the Jets might be like, oh, well, how come we don't love that guy as much as the genius Kyle Shanahan? Like, do you think there's a little bit of that gamesmanship maybe? Yeah. And it's funny how many people nowadays are like, well, we all knew Patrick Mahomes was going to be great. But when he was drafted, I think he was drafted, what, 11th or 10th overall? And they, they were like, Everybody said, "Oh, that's a reach." Oh, that was surprising that they took him at that time, and then he did what he did. Now he's Patrick Mahomes, and so yeah, I think everybody doesn't want to miss out on the next big thing, the next big quarterback. So I think that's in the head, but I don't, I don't know how much to believe the 49ers because the Jets and the 49ers are so I think they're so close, like because they're they worked together all last year, um, Sala and 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 Kyle Shanahan. They're like best friends, so I I mean. Really, I think they already told each other, this is who I'm taking, this is what's going on, and that's what made the Niners move up. So I don't think there's a lot of – and even Shanahan said it, like, you have the number three pick. We don't have to really play as play our cards as, as much as we do in the past. But there could be. I think the Jets and the Niners are both playing both of us – are playing the whole media and playing everybody in the world, and it could go a little bit different than what we think. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that. Because I mean, because we're all thinking Zach Wilson, and then either you you say you could say whatever a quarterback is is third, right? We all think Zach Wilson is going to the Jets, so, but say say Zach Wilson is the guy the 49ers wanted, right? And that's who the four and that you hear the 49ers really wanted Wilson. So say that the they got together at the pro day and they go, hey, we're just here to to blow smoke, but we're gonna take Justin Fields, and then the 49ers are like, oh, cool, we're we'll, we'll t- make that trade. And so say Justin Field goes number two, like we were talking about, and then Zach Wilson goes number three. Now, do we really look at that Niner trade as a bad trade? Not really. The only thing that we look at it as bad is, and it's just in our heads, is Mac Jones. If Mac Jones goes number three, then I'm kind of like, oh, my gosh. Yeah, I've been hearing those reports about Mac Jones, but, yeah, I don't think that's the reason why the 49ers move to three, but, hey, I might be wrong. They might be loving Mac Jones in the old-fashioned quarterback way. And I, here's the thing: is I, I'm rooting. I'm not rooting against Mac Jones. I'm not like, oh, I want this to be right. I want him to be bad. The expectation that comes with being drafted that high. Look what it's done to Mitch Trubisky. The guy's actually winning football games. And as fans, we look at him as like the biggest bust. We're just like, oh, this guy didn't work out at all. He actually played winning football. Yeah. So like yeah. Mac Mac Jones could he could actually pull like a Jimmy G where they win 11, 12 games behind a great running scheme, running attack. And then we'd still look at him and be like, well, he can't get them past, you know, the bucks or the Packers or the, you know, any of those teams in his division, the Rams, the Seahawks, especially the tough division to, to beat. So whoever they select better be the, the one that tops them all, all three of them, Arizona, Rams, Seattle, gotta be the top dog. Well, so I, I mentioned that we could see the first time ever four quarterbacks go one, two, three, four. But let's say the quarterbacks go one, two, three. Let's say it goes Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, and then Mac Jones, right? Let's just say Mac Jones goes number three, like, they're, like the rumors. So now Atlanta's on the clock. Atlanta can make the decision to go quarterback or they can go somewhere else, right? It depends on what they want to do. But there's teams like the Panthers. There's teams like uh, the Lions and the the Patriots, <laughs> Belichick sitting out there. Do you see one of those three teams trying to move up and getting a, a Justin Fields or the Trey Lance or say, say Mac Jones is that guy that falls at number, you know, from pick six to number eight. Do you see that one of those teams going, Hey, we're, we'll take one of these guys. 
Who who's at seven? Because I could see the Patriots Detroit. saying, who is it? Detroit. Detroit. I could see them reaching out and saying, like, hey, we'll we'll move up if one of these guys falls out of that top four. But I couldn't see a team like Atlanta trading their fourth pick to an interdivision rival Panthers, and then they land Justin Fields, and the kid, the kid from Atlanta is busting them up for a decade, then that, that would be like, oh, well, now the, the Falcons have found another way to choke away, you know, like games. It's like, we won't just do it late in historic fashion. We're actually going to just make sure we're bad by giving, you know, the Atlanta native to uh the panthers in carolina yeah, please, but please I come beat us down please come beat us down twice a year here's your here. <laughs> yes it's literally what the falcons tell tom brady to do beat us up twice a year for us please thank you yeah. mr ryan is about three <laughs> slash 28 <laughs> 20. all i know is the quarterback position is going to be a, a big talk in this draft and not every quarterback makes it right and to I, I found some numbers uh, uh, the other day, and I was talking about them, and I forget what they are, but in the last 25 years, a Bleacher Report went back the last 25 years, and they did a sample, and quarterbacks are the hardest ones to pick and become all pros. I think out of the last 25 years, I think it was like 5% of the quarterbacks drafted in the first round became all pros. Small e, you want, you want to get in on this? Because I have some thoughts. It's a small number. It's, it's a huge risk, but it's a high reward if you find that right person. Look at the Chiefs, for example. They selected Patrick Mahomes in the, in the top 10 in the NFL draft. And they sat on down with Alex Smith. Alex Smith was a quarterback. And then he, once Patrick Mahomes became a star, they almost made it to the Super Bowl. But, of course, you guys know how the Chiefs defense screwed that up, for example. And then Deshaun Watson, at number three, he's been a pretty good quarterback in this league, honestly. He's like about top five, top five quarterback, although he's with the scandals and stuff like that right now. But it's very it's it's going to be it's hard to find the right person. Like for example, Josh Rosen for the Cardinals, he was selected top ten and he was out of there in one year. So it's really hard to find a quarterback to be like your true quarterback that could be the next Dan Marino, for example, or the next Tom Brady, for example, or the next Joe Namath. You never know. It's very hard, and especially in the NFL, because you can make it or you can break your, break it. Yes. And I, this is what I always talk about with quarterbacks at the top of drafts is that it's, you, you have to be drafted into a foundation, right? Like if you're building a house, you wouldn't just like put a roof on nothing. Right. And that's sort of the final piece, whatever it is, I don't really know about building. So I don't know what you would put, <laughs> but you need, you have to have foundation. You have to have coaching and offensive line and scheme and fit and whatever it is. Like very rarely will you see a team like the Baltimore Ravens go from Joe Flacco, then take a running quarterback and redo the entire thing. But the thing is, is that the foundation of that organization is so strong. They can say, Hey, we have the super talented player. Let's build things to fit around him. Now can Lamar Jackson take the next level to match his passing ability to his, if he were able to throw at even a top 10 level, the Baltimore Ravens would go on like a four or five year winning streak of, of being in the Super Bowl. Like it would be ridiculous. I, I also think they need to do a better job of getting him weapons. I think that will be addressed in this year's draft by the Ravens because there's a lot of talent out there at wide receiver. Um, and they need to start picking some guys that are over the, you know, five foot nine marker or whatever. Like if I can stand eye to eye with you, you need to be a little bit taller uh, in the in the NFL wide receiver position. But if you draft these young kids in the top and they're going to the Bengals and they're going to these other teams, the Browns, like we're seeing, they get foundation with Cleveland. They bring in Stefanski, good system, you know, proven that he's going to just stay the course. You can start to win games. But otherwise, you end up on these bad teams where they're rotating out coaches and GMs. It's just going to repeat itself. Yeah, I agree. You can't you can't. You have to find your foundation. It's hard to do. And, and that's, you know, it goes back to your team, E, the Dolphins. They're on a course right now and they got to stay that course. I know they have a lot of question marks, but that's what you got to do. You got to find what's working for you. Keep going that path and don't, because the NFL, uh, unfortunately, is what have you done for me lately? So people are in favor and out of favor so quickly. It's not even funny anymore. Of, and like you said, we mentioned Tony mentioned Mitchell Trubisky. He won games for, for the Bears, but people didn't like it. People didn't like it. So 
the littlest things in the NFL can get you on the outskirts looking in and it's, it's, it's a tough road to go, but uh, you got anything else to say on the, on that topic? Uh, e? Not as much than just hearing, just re- reminding me of the suffering the Dolphins who had to go through coaching in and out coaches and general managers. That's how it reminds me of through as a Dolphins fan, just seeing so many coaches and so only general managers go through and it's repeated. But finally, hopefully Brian Flores is the answer that we are we're looking for, but it's looking promising a lot. So that's my conclusion. Well, I'm a Raider fan. One playoff, win, one playoff game in the last, like what, 18, 19 years. So um, yeah, I, I'm right there with you. I don't, and, I, and you know, I, we're, we're right there with John Gruden this year. Like if he doesn't perform, do you get rid of him? Do you stay the course? It's a, it's, it's a big deal, but that's why I'm glad that baseball's back. That's why I'm glad I'm wearing my champion 2020 uh, Dodger, even though, they pissed me off and lost opening day to the lonely Colorado Rockies who people uh, were saying could lose a hundred games, but baseball's back. Are you guys excited? Are you guys baseball guys? I'm a little bit of a baseball guy. I I've been to, I've been some to some opener games, especially like, like you're the Rockies being your team. They used to play the Marlins a few years back ago. It was their opening day 10 and one. It was like when Jose Fernandez was still alive. So, Jose, I feel like Jose Fernandez could have been like a Hall of Famer. Had he still been alive and still keeping that production, I think he would have been a Hall of Famer. This is going back to how much I know about baseball. But I'm very excited about the baseball, although the Marlins lost yesterday, one nothing against Tampa, as usual. That's the Marlins fashion. Give you disappointing results. But I think this is going to be a good uh, baseball year, and, I, and hopefully they can keep going. I know there has been some COVID issues with the Mets and the Nationals right now, but – I'm very excited to see where this baseball season can go and see if there cannot be too many COVID-19 issues along the way. Okay. Um, Jose Fernandez, that's the guy who the speedboat accident or yeah. whatever. Uh, yeah, he was a stud. That's it's probably about the last time that I really watched baseball on a regular basis. Joe, I'm going to, I'm going to throw you this bone. Since joining the, the war zone sports network, I am going to, rededicate myself to at least following baseball again right so I can be up to date on conversations um it was to me baseball loses me in the length of the season right like you could be excited about the beginning of the year and I was much more in it when I played fantasy baseball right like I used to pay for the MLB package and I would watch all the games and cheer once it gets to I don't I really love October baseball for sure. Uh, I'll usually check out the the All Star break and stuff like that. But I, I'm always I'm always down to to take in a baseball game. I go out to uh, my one of my best friends is uh, from Boston, and so we go. We have a road trip every year when the when the Sox go to Anaheim. We get tickets in center field, and he sits there and harasses Mike Trout. Although Mike Trout way nicer when we went there than Mookie Betts was, even though he was wearing a Mookie Betts jersey, he was like, "Hey, like trying." But every time Trout would turn around and be like and wave to him, I'm like, "I wonder if it's because you're heckling him, or he really is just that nice of a guy." <laughs> but, uh, I, I also get lost in this with baseball. Please, please lower your your steroid use policy let's go back to my heyday in baseball because i would watch i would come home every day i grew up a cubs fan because wgn is what what i got in my section of the world and so i would watch andre dawson and you know ryan sandberg and then we move into that like fun era with bonds rubbing the cleat you know cream all Mm -hmm. over his body Mm -hmm. And, and you got sosa and mcguire just jacking balls out of the park chicks dig the long ball was the greatest campaign nobody wants to see it's like at some point it starts to become soccer it's why we don't love soccer in this country there's not enough scoring and enough action and enough you know like the one move i like was taking out the collision at home plate i didn't like what happened with buster posey so if we could kind of curve that rule but all of the other rules is they like did i read somewhere that they're like deadening the baseball or something this year like is that true um was it deadening or doing the opposite way i know they're doing something to the ball and i'm not sure uh which way but pitchers are already complaining about it but pitchers have been cl- complaining about it for the last uh couple of years that they think that the ball is slicker and they can't get a good grip on it and any, anything like that anymore but like you said i just had this conversation with joe skirtle the other day and i and i told him 
chicks dig the long ball. Like you said, home runs sell tickets. Baseball enthusiasts, fans, and the guys that love baseball, the old school baseball, can sit there and they can watch the no hitters. They can watch the two to one games. But your casual fans that want to go to games, have a great time, they want to see that ball fly. They want to see it go. And Sam, Sammy, so, and this is what, okay, let me, Major League Baseball is pissing me off. They pissed me off already with the, the, the Hall of Fame, nobody getting in the Hall of Fame this year. And Sammy Sosa, Mark McGuire, Barry Bonds, all these guys saved baseball. They saved baseball in that summer of, not what, 96? I was a little kid at that time. But I remember watching baseball, and I remember staying home by myself watching Mark McGuire break that record. Like, baseball went on strike uh what a couple years before that or was it that year i'm not remembering uh correctly when they went on strike but i remember people weren't going to the games people were done with baseball they said we will never go to baseball games again the home runs brought them back and i I think you're making i know they they brought back the launch angle uh or they always brought up the launch angle so many guys are trying to hit home runs that's why the averages for baseball players are down now it's like two fit they're batting like 260 250 but they're hitting 30 home runs because they're all trying to hit jacks uh, and they want them to, but yeah, I understand where you're coming from, Tony, with the length of the season. Uh, uh, it is a long season. It is the, some of the baseball games last a little bit longer than, uh, you know, what about three hours, I think a tops for a baseball game. So I understand where people can get bored with it, but I mean, there's, uh, I don't know. I, I can go to Dodger stadium, sit there, eat some Dodger dogs, you got the music going, you got the lights going. It's just, I mean, I don't, I don't like day game baseball. Day game baseball is like horrible to me, I think, but like you got the night with the lights and you got the flashing lights, you got the dancing and doing all that stuff. Then the baseball is exciting to me, no matter what's going on. Yeah. I don't, I like the idea of it having to be sped up a little bit. I think they, didn't they try to do something like that where there's like sort of a, a clock on how fast they, they can, they have to move and get the ball to home plate and stuff like that. I think elements like that can definitely help. I also think that there was a little bit of a complaint from guys like Tory Hunter back in the day where he was saying like the, uh, the problem was that baseball was marketing its black faces, but they were really like Cubans, Dominicans. They were like, you know, Afro Latinos and stuff like that. It, baseball doesn't really have a ton of like, American born stars in it. And I think there's a little bit of an element of that, but also too, just the marketing of baseball feels sort of old and outdated, right? There, yeah. I don't really know what you could do to make it younger and flashier or whatever, other than, uh, like I said, allowing these players, if you're going to play 162 games, people don't give credit the, the beating that it takes on your body to go out and compete, you know, that in, that intensely right even if you're not taking the hits you do in some of these other sports it's still that like getting your body to play a physical peak 162 times is wear and tear the mental strain that comes with playing baseball having to stay focused and be ready and taking cuts at 100 mile an hour fastballs that is physically draining so if somebody needs a little bit of a boost to get out on the field then I'm fine with it if they're fine with it. I'm not saying let's inject them with HGH, but if they want to do a little taste, I'm fine. Let's yeah. go. If they if they're okay with it, let them do it. <laughs> it's all better. E. Okay, Tony touched on something that I, I I believe is 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 firm is that baseball doesn't do a great job at attacking the young kids in America to get them to watch the sport. E. I know. I, I, how old are you, um, E? I am 19, going to turn 20 this month. <laughs> so let me throw a name at you. King Griffey Jr. Do you know who King Griffey Jr. is? I've, I've heard of the guy before. I, I've heard he's the, uh, either he's the young, youngest or the oldest one. I think he's the youngest. Yeah, I'm King saying. Griffey Jr. is his son. son. Uh, but this King Griffey, and this is, I tried to make a case of this uh, a couple weeks ago when they hired. They hired King Griffey Jr. as the ambassador to baseball now he's supposed to be the one that's going to bring kids and everybody back to baseball but to me king and uh, uh, Tony and i are about around the, around the same age king griffey jr is the man he's the i could show you right now show 
first baseball card I ever bought. King Griffey Jr. Boom, right here. I bought this plaque. I went to the mall. It was sitting there. I said, King Griffey Jr. It's a bat. Everybody our age, around Tony and, and, and my age, we all stood up and we all did the King Griffey. We all put our hat on backwards. Yep. Like King Griffey. Everybody did that. But nowadays, I don't think King Griffey relates. Um, one, the King, the Griffey's name and the way they act around people um, from my personal experience and from other experiences from that I've heard, they're not the most relatable people to uh, talk to, right? Um, sorry, I have, I'm, I'm not fond of the King Griffey's uh, seniors and stuff like that because of the history that I have with them. But I think they need to, to find more players that people would know about. People, young players, kids know about and get them into the community just the nfl does a great job with it the nfl does their camps they do all kinds of stuff but you never hear about that in baseball and a couple years ago the dodgers they finally made the deal last year but the dodgers weren't on local tv 70 percent of the people in southern california couldn't watch the dodgers on tv and that took away from me. That took me. I mean, I could sit there and watch a Dodger game every night, and my kids will sit there and they watch it. I think you just lost uh, so many fans doing just taking the team off TV, and the Padres are dealing with that right now. Uh, it's all about money in Major League Baseball and what they can do, but they're not looking at the future and where they're losing people. And they cut a bunch of minor league teams as well this year, so they're losing players left and right. If, and if you don't know what's going on in Major League Baseball. So, Joe, I got a question. When you say you can't watch them, is it, I think I, could, I get the games because it's Spectrum, right? You're talking about the contracts, the TV deals that they make, the exclusivity rights and stuff? Yeah, so they made that – the Dodgers made a deal with, uh, with Spectrum, which was Time Warner at that time, where it was exclusively on those. And most people have – you know, they had DirecTV or another cable company at that time. So, like me, I, didn't, I had DirecTV at that time, so I couldn't watch them unless I went to Spectrum. And uh, DirecTV offered me better stuff than what Spectrum was offering me at that time. So I didn't do it. So if I wanted to watch the Dodgers, I had to either. And then, and then say like a game, like yesterday's game, for example, it comes on ESPN. If you don't have Spectrum or the Dodgers, it's an, it's an out of market. If you have a cable company that doesn't have Spectrum. Um, and I turned on ESPN. So I turned on ESPN yesterday. Uh, the Dodger game was blacked out because I'm out of market or I'm in the market. I'm in the Dodger market, but it's, 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 I can't watch it because it's on that Dodger channel that I have to go pay extra for. Yeah. So two, I'm getting two things from here. One, I don't know why you just don't switch to spectrum. I did that. Right. I still get the red zone channel with spectrum. I, and it's like, cost me like an extra five bucks a month. And two, I'm a little worried about you abusing your child, you know, children, making them sit down and watch nine inning Dodger games at game one of the season. All right. We'll talk about that off camera. Um, <laughs> Ken Griffey, like, first of all, 19, congratulations. Enjoy your life. Fantastic. I didn't know you were that young. You're, you're way ahead of the game getting all of this. I wish I had all of these little abilities to do things when I was like 19, I would have been crushing it on uh, uh, social media and talk and sports and stuff like that. Ken Griffey Jr., it's like they didn't do a good job of keeping the legacy alive. And then they went through a decade where they could have been propping these guys up and then bashed them all with co Senate court hearings and stuff, talking about shaming them into ruining the game that they love. So we can't even like look at Mark, you know, Mark McGuire, Roger Clemens, any of those guys. And then you get the guys that actually have personality and they're fun. The Nick Swishers of the world, right? It's fun to see him on TV. You get A-Rod and his overly tan behind on TV. But then you get somebody that, like, Dave, everybody loves David Poppy. Again, he doesn't quite relate in the, like, there's like a little bit of like the, let's say the, not, not a language barrier because he does speak English. But it's like people aren't jazzed about, about him. So yeah. it's like, there is no real way to market baseball other than to, because you have to start over from scratch. So you have to like get people hyped about this game, these home runs. Here's my suggestion that I thought about while you were talking. Baseball has a lot of downtime in between plays, announcing guys walking up. Why don't they bring in like good entertaining storytellers of the fans during the broadcast and say, Hey, like, for innings three, four, and five, we're going to talk about some of our favorite memories of the Chicago Cubs with Bill Murray. 
You know, like that's a, just an example of like, a, or John Cusack is a big Cubs fan. John Cusack is going to join us, you know, on the phone here. And in between, we're going to get little snip, like to find a way to add entertainment, bring the past in with the present and have some sort of like live interaction while we're watching the game. I'd be more inclined to do that rather than somebody who was like, that's a ball three right there. Now, if he walks this guy, we're going to have a guy as a runner's in second and third. But it, it's yeah, not going to. So you guys, nobody's going to watch that. You guys didn't get spoiled. Dodger fans got spoiled for a long time with Vin Scully. Vin Scully does his – he didn't need to bring anybody on. No. Vin Scully will sit there and he – it doesn't matter who, who the Dodgers are playing. He'd be like, oh, Tony Tucker's up the bat, right? Tony Tucker. Let me tell you about Tony Tucker. Back in 1956, his parents did this, this, and this. And that was the greatest thing about Vin Scully. And now when Vin Scully's gone, same thing with Chick Hearn of the, of the Los Angeles Lakers. When they got rid of these guys, these old school guys that will tell you everything and every, and they've been around because Vince Gulley was calling games, you know, um, with all these old school players from the from when they moved to, to L.A. all the way through. So he knew all the history and he'll tell you the history and he'll tell you the backstory of everything. So we were kind of spoiled. And that's what I, exactly why Dodger fans were spoiled, because they got what you wanted right there, Tony. They got the backstories of everything. He wasn't just talking, you know, strike one, strike two. He was giving you the insides and outs of every single player, Dodgers, not Dodgers. And you were, I thought, while watching the game for those of the, you know, the nine innings that he called, I was actually learning more about the players than the actual game of baseball. And it was, it was a great uh, experience for me. Uh, yes. Uh, I, hang on, I'm sorry. Cause you just reminded me of one of my favorite stories from Vince Scully where he's like, he, he's sitting there and he's like, He's like, well, coming to the plate is Manny Ramirez. Oh, yes, a great ball player. And he's like, oh, he takes a pitch inside. In 1970, you know, or like 1986, I was in the Dominican Republic handing out stuff. Oh, we got another pitch, and he takes the pitch looking. And he's just <laughs> weaving it in throughout the at bat, and he's telling a story. And there was a young kid who had no cleats and no shoes or whatever. And then at the very end, he's like, oh, and he hits a single to right field. That young man was Manny Ramirez. And you're just like, holy shit. He somehow was able to weave a story about Manny Ramirez and being from the DR or wherever. And I was just like, dude, this man paints a beautiful picture. I do, however, Joe, think that's in the past. I don't think young people are down with that. They're into 15 second TikTok videos and we need to get some like current <laughs> fans to come on and hype them. E, you're on TikTok. Let's go. Get that going. Get the 15 second baseball <laughs> going. And <laughs> well, I'll just be talking crap about my, my Marlins. <laughs> That's what hey, let be. me let me ask you that. Derek Jeter. What does Derek Jeter mean to a guy your age? Derek Jeter is a, is a guy that came from New York Yankees, is what I remember. He was a, he was a New York Yankees, so that doesn't really help with it. Of course, you, you think of him because he's a champion. We need something like that. We haven't won a, a World Series since 2003, quoting the New York Yankees on that, which we were supposed to win that. We were actually trashed that year in 2003, but somehow we managed to win a World Series then because we were collapsing at the same time. But the, but for Derek, Derek Cheater, Derek, eh, I can't even say his name right now, Derek Cheater, I'm hoping he can bring up something. I mean, he got us to the playoffs last year, but of course, shorter games, 60 games. It was the first time since Mars has been there since 2003. But they, they, but this time they didn't go to the World Series. It's the only time they only been in the playoffs twice, and they've been to the World Series from those two times. Period. I'm, I'm not trying to uh, to dish your your baseball knowledge or anything like that. I'm just trying to show an example of how bad uh, Major League Baseball is doing in in preserving their history uh, uh, and showing people because. If I if I mention those two guys, if I mention King Griffey Jr. and Derek Jeter, people should be like, "Wow, those are uh, amazing Hall of Fame guys, uh, the greatest players to ever walk the earth." You know what I mean? And, and I mentioned it to you, and you're 19 years old, and you're like, "Oh he, yeah, he, I, I hear he's a good player." And and I think that's what we get into in the modern uh, sports discussions now is, and 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 it's it, it works for me like me and Tony's too. Like we see the guys that we grew up watching uh, better than anybody else too uh, in certain times. But uh, it's just weird that baseball doesn't, because if, if I mentioned uh, a top football player, like, like you mentioned earlier, you said Dan Marino, you know, everything about Dan Marino and you hold Dan Marino up here. But then I mentioned King Griffey Jr. And you're like, Oh, he's, he's right here. He's 
So yeah, like I, I've heard of his name, but it is not like what comes off to the top of my head where I can recall how he was as a player, as a major league baseball player, if you want to put it in that perspective. Yeah, yeah I'm trying to think of like the greatest Marlins too. Like Hamley Ramirez played for the Marlins, right, at one point. Like uh, was it Jose Reyes down there? Like didn't they have like a bunch of the young talent uh, yeah. when we were younger in our 90s, in, in the 90s, right? Wasn't that where – Well, see, I, you look at the Marlins as a crappy organization, right? I and and I look at them as like they're a, a good team, but then they always have that fire cell. So it was like they were winning like yeah. World Series like once every ten years or something like that. Uh, they had Gary Sheffield, they had Luis Gonzalez, they had um, at one point they had a guy named Luis Castillo that was I remember him because he was going on the going for the hit streak, the the fifty six game hit streak. I think he got up to like thirty something at that point. Um, they've had a, a bunch of of great young talent and then once they get it they ship it all away yeah yeah that's the, that's the thing with the marlins like they get great talent but then after that one year all right they're shipping out like john carl Stanton, for example he was a he was a marlins and he got traded to the yankees it's like and every single player what's funny is all the players that we traded away like recently they somehow do well other places which is just what i noticed yeah, i but... wonder if a salary cap would be the right move for baseball right like if we could take up, because the Yankees have the TV deal so they can spend exorbitant money. The Dodgers can do the same thing and the Cubs did it. But yeah, we used to consider the Marlins and the Rays and stuff like that, the farm system, <laughs> the professional farm system, theater organizations for the, the major league teams. But like every once in a while when they had a good team, they would spend money and they'd bring in the Al Lighters and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, but when you talk to old faith, whenever you talk to somebody who's like our age and they're like, oh, yeah, do you remember Mike Gallego and Greg Gagne? And it's like you, you just start these names where it's like, who? Like, but that's how baseball fans are, is that we remember, you know, the guy who hit ninth in a lineup because the game is so long, you can be able to absorb so much. I don't remember who was like even the seventh or eighth man on the Pistons 2004 championship team. <laughs> because I just cared about the big five or six that were coming in and out of the game. But I can tell you who like, you know, who played left field, you know, on, on a bad Cubs team or something like that. Like when I sit down and think about it, because I just had so long to sit there and absorb it. Like this season alone, the Dodgers payroll is at $226 million, right? Uh, you take it all the way down. So that's the number one team right now. Take it all the way down. The, it looks like the Cleveland Indians are the the lowest payroll at forty nine. So there's look at that forty nine million to two hundred and what did I say two hundred and twenty six twenty six. There's a big difference there in talent and everything that you're doing. And I know, I know. Well, that's not even it because it says Baltimore is at twenty four. So I don't know what. Yeah, why. I saw that somewhere where the Baltimore the Baltimore has a, a lower payroll than like. 10 guys in major league baseball like they're they're gonna pay i was gonna say the like, whole team less than like 10 different superstars if, if, are making i guess okay so 24 is is there is there so 24 million is their lowest so maybe if you put a uh how much they had to spend if you put a, a bottom number because i know at the top they ha they do like uh they call it like a revenue tax or something like that so if you spend over a certain amount for one year you get taxed this percentage and then if you do it two years in a row, now it's 50%. So whatever, you, so the Dodgers have to pay, you know, not only did they pay the 200 and something million dollars in payroll, they had to pay 25% in taxes of that payroll. Then the next year, if they did it twice, they had to pay 50. And then they do it for the third year, it's like 100. So that's why you saw like the the Dodgers and the the uh, Red Sox a couple of years ago, they both dumped players and they lowered their salary to get under that third year of doing it. So they have a little bit, but they don't they don't give an incentive for you to, to spend money. So those bottom teams, which I mean, the Marlins are now, but it's always like the Pirates, the Orioles. Uh, um, I mean, I don't I don't really consider the Indians, even though they're down there. But those bottom teams that never spend money, what do we have to do to force them to make to spend the money? And that's what baseball. I think that's what that's why people are drawn off one because of the length of the game. And two, because you don't have you have the top teams that are always spending money and always going to be there, and those bottom teams are we can always forget about them. 
Well, yeah, they're taking the collective bargaining money uh, and just putting it in their pockets. Well, you know, you're asking a rich guy, do you want to turn a profit or do you want to field a, a team that's going to end up losing to the Yankees anyways? And they're like, why don't you put a little coin in my pocket and I'll put it into real estate somewhere. The, I do like, however, some of the Billy Bean type stuff, right? That always intrigues me. Like somewhere at some point in the middle of the season, I kind of start rooting for whatever that team is where they're like, oh, can you believe this team's payroll is at 37 million and they're winning, you know, they're in first place. And all of a sudden I start rooting for them. It never ends up, ends up the way that I would like it to, but I do find myself uh, tend to root for them. The other thing that I am excited for is for fans to be back in stadiums and to see how loud they can boo the, che the cheating Astros. Like which stadium wants to come and bring it and just boo the, these guys That's right out of the building? Yeah, the Astros have it coming. I, I don't want to see any more thrown at the heads, but a good, a good boo. Uh, e, you got anything else to say on baseball? Nothing much, Joe. Hopefully the Marlins can just win something this year, honestly. That's all I hope for, a winning record. That's all any, anybody can hope for. And, and you guys got to remember uh, Kansas City Royals. Let's, let's root for the Royals this year because Patrick Mahomes uh, has an ownership stake <laughs> ownership in him. And we can see Patrick Mahomes and all that in the, you know, do his thing. But I appreciate you guys joining us. E, uh, let everybody know where we can find you. You can find me on, on TikTok, Instagram, all social media platforms. Plus, I do a podcast as well. Those you can find on YouTube and all streaming platforms. That's where you will find me, E on the mic, or on some some of the E on the mic show. All right, guys, look E up on the mic up. I'll also list that down. You guys are watching the Warzone Sports Network. This is one of the three weekly shows that we have going on right now. If you guys don't want to miss anything, make sure you hit that like button, hit, hit that subscribe button, and hit that notification button so you're always in the know. And the guy that's filled in for Mike, and man, I might have to make it a permanent thing because – you're, you're way better looking than Mike. You're more knowledgeable. And we didn't have to go through Charger Talk. Uh, oh. This is Tony Tucker, the brand new addition to the Warzone Sports Network. And he will be having his own show pretty soon. So, guys, that's why you're going to hit that notification button. So when Tony Tucker has his own show and his own contribute to, uh, to the Warzone Sports Network, you guys will see everything that he has. So, Tony, you got anything to, to end, end this with? Uh, no, no, let's just get it. Next on the mic is my man E. Come on, E, sing that song. E, you stepped in, you uh, stepped into the war zone and you did great. You're welcome back anytime. For Tony and Tucker and I, we're out of here.